The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It's inspired. God breathed. This book is like no other book. But the book needs to be rightly divided. It needs to be understood according to the scripture. This is what is, it's incumbent upon us to do that. It's so very, very important to understand that you never take a New Testament revelation of doctrine and compare it to an Old Testament revelation and try to change it. Never do that. Never do that. Because the New Testament revelation is a further revelation of what the Old Testament reveals. It clarifies some things and introduces some new things. And this is what we're looking at here. He said, no, I didn't come to call fire down from heaven. I came to save men's lives. In John chapter number 1 and verse number 17, we read these words. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a wonderful thing. You say, what's he talking about? The law. He's talking about the Torah. He's talking about the first five books of the Bible and the Mosaic law that was given at Sinai. Now they've also got about 613 other laws. But what we're dealing with here is the law was given by Moses. He was the law giver. He was doing what God called him to do. He was a shining light in his day. There's nothing wrong with the law. The law is holy, the apostle Paul said. We know that. But he said something has changed. He said grace and truth has come by Jesus Christ. Now, my friend, it doesn't mean there's no grace in the Old Testament. It's in there. And, of course, his word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. But what we're looking at here is something that moves past the law and opens up for us to light and understanding that they did not have under that. If you notice carefully, grace and truth came by a person. And that person is grace. That person is truth. That person is the light of the world. That person is the manna that came down from God out of heaven. That person is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father. That person is the resurrection and the life. Amen. There is none like him. None ever lived like him. None ever spoke like him. He's unique and one of a kind. And thanks be unto God for the fact that I know him this morning. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So the Bible's very clear about this. Never take an Old Testament doctrine and try to change it, my dear friend. Never take the New Testament and go back to the Old to try to change the revelation of the truth of God. Look at Matthew chapter number 5 at verse number 28. He said, Hear that you heard it said of them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Did you get this? No man can do that. We don't have the authority to do that. Any man that tries to say something like that is arrogant and full of himself. But the Lord Jesus Christ can because he's the author of the book. He's grace and truth. Note carefully. He goes into a much deeper understanding of what's going on here. He goes into the heart. He searches the heart and the soul. He reveals the hidden things. And he says in verse 28, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You see that? This is a further revelation. It's a deeper revelation. But it's the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Now look at Matthew chapter number 5, verse 38. You've heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you. You see this? The world is full of people that I know a few, a few scriptures. They cherry pick a few things out of the Bible. Judge not that you be not judged. And you know, ever take a little wine for your stomach's sake and the man upstairs and that's about all they know of the Bible. Amen. But that's not us, folks. We've got a book that we believe. And he said, but I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now watch the progression. Look carefully now. Book of James chapter number four and verse number seven. He said, resist not evil. But now we have James telling us something. James chapter number 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
First Peter chapter 5 and verse number 9. The Bible should be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil's a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 8, verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Did you catch this now? The Lord Jesus Christ says resist not evil. Then we have two apostles saying resist the evil one who is the devil. Is that a contradiction preacher? No, it's a dispensational thing. I'm trying to show you how to rightly divide the word of truth. For the Lord Jesus Christ said, if he smites you on one cheek, turn the other and let him smite that one. But then later he said, buy a sword. And this, of course, must be understood in the time element as it unfolds and progresses through the Bible. The Bible's a wonderful book. And if you're bored with it, it's because you're bored. If you don't know the Bible, it's because you've never asked God to open the scripture to you and show you the things that matter. So the Bible says the law and the prophets were until John. But since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. The law and the prophets, three divisions of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings. And this is to this very day, the same thing. So the law was quite a thing. I'm glad, thank God, that I am not under the law. I'm glad I wasn't born under the law. The only law that I was born under is the law of death, the law of sin. And that brings forth death. But thanks be unto God for the one that rose from the dead and broke the power of the law. Here's some illustrations from the law. Take Korah, for example, when they were in the wilderness. Korah said, you're not the only one that can rise up and lead these people. So can we. Moses went before God and God said, I'm going to show you a new thing. And he opened up the earth and swallowed them into it. There's no much grace there, is there? No, that's the law and its holiness. The law reflects the holiness of God. The law is holy. Look at it. It reflects the holiness of God. And so therefore, here they are standing before the law. And all they could get from it was holy, holy, holy. And what will it do to anything if all you get from the law is holy, holy, holy? You're done for. I'm glad, thank God, for one who is holy himself. And he can stand before the holy, holy, holy and be received. So therefore the law cannot condemn me because it condemned him. And he rose on the third day. Victor over death, hell and the grave. Achan fell under the, command, uh, fell under the condemnation of the law. And Achan and his family were taken to the valley of Achor. His wife, his children, and stoned to death. That's rough stuff, isn't it? You're looking at the heavy hand of the law in the Old Testament. You have Nadab and Abihu. Who are they? They're the, they're the two sons of Aaron. They're his sons. Who is Aaron? He is the high priest. He's the first high priest of Israel. He loved the Lord. He lived for the Lord. He approached God. He went into the Holy of Holies. He was the only one in all of Israel that could do that. But his two sons took strange fire into the tabernacle. And when they did, God smote them. The fire reached out and consumed them. And they died in their tracks. That's tough stuff. Aren't you glad you're not living that kind of world? We have a man who went out on the Sabbath day. And he picked up sticks. He was picking up sticks to start a fire. Picking up sticks to feed his family so they could cook the food. I'm sure his motive was altogether honorable. He was picking up sticks. But the man was taken, caught and taken, and he was stoned to death because he was breaking the holiness of the law. God meant for them to understand, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The, the seraphim in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6, as he was coming forth from that holy one that is trained, his glory filled the temple. He came forth and he said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Is he holy? Still holy. That's nothing's changed. He changes not. He's immutable. Saying yesterday, today, and forever. So why are we so easily approached God? How is it that we have an altar that they know not of? How is it that we can come in here with our baggage today loaded down with sin and hell and still come down here and get on our knees before God? Good question. Because of one person that you're able to do that. One person makes all the difference in the world. Now, God started man. He gave him innocence. Adam was innocent. There in an innocent world, he walked with Adam in the cool of the day and they had fellowship together. God longed for that fellowship probably far more than Adam ever did. But he wanted to be with this creature that he'd made in his own image. Not another creature anywhere on this earth, but Adam was made in the image of God. 
And I'm not so sure I still understand all that that means, but I'll tell you one thing. He was head dang shoulders above everything else. Nowhere in the Bible does it say an angel was made in the image of God or a seraphim or a cherubim. That means that God cannot have fellowship with angels and cherubim and seraphim like he can with a man. That fellowship he has with a man is precious to God. Can two walk together except to be agreed? God wants to walk with you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to be number one in your life. But here we have Adam sins against God. How does it end? This time of innocence, it ends with a spiritual invasion from heaven to destroy the line of the Messiah. They all had their agenda, but Satan had his. These angels left their first estate, Peter said came to the daughters of men and they went after the bloodline of Adam. And the Bible said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was perfect in his generation. The scripture's word translated perfect is Tanin. It means that he was a direct blood descendant of Adam. No corruption anywhere in it. And so he went after. Of course God brought him through. Then he let them have human government. Govern yourselves, God says. All right, let's see how you do. They governed themselves. Do you saw what happened? Nimrod built a tower that would reach into heaven. Nimrod in the Old Testament married his own mother, Semiramis. Incest starts right off the bat. Go out in the pagan world and ask them. Nimrod and Semiramis marry. Semiramis' son, her son, and they marry. And they have a child. His name is Tammuz. And Tammuz winds up with some kind of a death, an accidental death or something. The story changes as you go. But every, every year at the planting season, at a certain time of the year, the pagan would begin to cry and weep and, 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 and be burdened because of Tammuz, because of the horror that had befallen him. Guess what? In the book of Ezekiel, God said, I want you to look into that wall, Ezekiel. Look behind that curtain. I want you to look at something. And Ezekiel found women. Women weeping, women tears running down their face for Tammuz. These are the daughters, sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And here are the ones who had the light and they turned from the light. Here are the ones who had the oracles of God. Nobody else had them and they turned away from them. God's showing you how you can govern yourself. You can't govern yourself. Look at us now. We're ready to go into World War III. You got a monster over there in Moscow that's killing women and children, blowing up, blowing up the hospitals with pregnant women in them. He has no bounds. He knows no bounds. He's he's a, he's a law unto himself. If he says it, it's so. If he decides he's going to do it, it's going to get done. That's the kind of ruler. And right now, folks, don't pass it off as hyperbole. Mark my words. We may be on the verge of World War III, but I'm going to tell you something else we're on the verge of. Come up hither. <laughs> Amen. If it takes World War III to bring the Lord Jesus Christ back, even so come, Lord Jesus. Because man cannot rule himself. He cannot govern himself. It is scratch and claw, kill. The Bible said the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. That's what they're doing now. So human government fails. What's the next one? Promise. What's the promise? That's when God reached down into darkness and he called a man. His name was Abram. He called him out of area of the Chaldees. He called him right smack from the place where Nimrod had built his tower. Called him out of it. Called him away from it. And Abram listened to God and came and left it. And when he did, he came to the promised land. And it was all about promise. And it was about one that God revealed grace to. And he showed him that he'd be the father of the faithful. His seed one day would be a blessing to all the world. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, God said to Abraham. And so what happens with this one? Well, I'll tell you what happens. They wind up in Egypt and the Egyptian Pharaoh tries to wipe out Israel again kill all the males he's going after the messianic line again satan wants to destroy that prophecy of genesis 3:15. the messiah is coming from the seed of the woman and so it goes then what happens well he brings them under law he prepares them for the law the law is is, is what they're ready for when they leave out of egypt it's there the passover was instituted the passover was the greatest feast day still is as far as the jews concerned there's nothing greater than passover because all of it depends on Passover. And the next thing would be Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when the Arabs came against them, the day of fasting and prayer in Israel, Yom Kippur. So here we have in law given to them. What happened? 
had it law in, same thing. It ended with Herod, the so-called great, trying to destroy all the seed of the promise of Genesis chapter number three, verse number 15, from two years old and under. And so then what happens? Well, after that, my dear friend, God calls his church out. He calls his church out, the Gentile church. That's what we're part of. And my friend, we don't answer to the law. We answer to Christ. Christ is the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's the embodiment of the law. He's everything the law could never be. He's all of it. It all becomes a person. Let me tell you a true Christian. You want to hear about a real Christian? He doesn't talk about himself. He doesn't talk about his buildings. He's not interested in his accomplishments and the praise that's, that's, that's hung up on him. A real Christian is about Christ. We love him. We pray to him. He's with us. He's everything. Amen, folks. There is none greater. When I pray, I pray to him. When I heard, I call, talk to him. When I have sin in my life, I confess it to him. He's my everything. He's what we're about. A Christian, they said, you know, it was an appellation they laid on them. And, you know, they, we're gonna, we got to name them something. The people of this way at first was. So what are we going to call them? What call them Christians? That's it. Everybody, Christian. Christian. The Christians heard it and said, that's okay. That's fine with me. That's just fine because it means like Christ. Amen. Like Christ. Folks, if you've never met him, why don't you get rid of your religious association? Why don't you just, just for the first time in your life, be true to yourself. Instead of trying to please people or be accepted by the crowd, just come to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I don't know a whole lot of things, but I, you don't need to know a lot of things. All you need to know is that Christ is the Savior and there's none other. It'll end in total apostasy, though. The age of grace, church age, ends in absolute and complete total apostasy. Say, when's that going to happen? You're living in it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're here. It's arrived. You're living in an aberration. In other words, it's not true Christianity. It's a fake. It's a falsehood. It, it has a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. From such turn away. It's not talking about pagans, folks. When they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They're denying everything that we're about. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. How's it end? Total apostasy, and it ends when the creatures come again. In Daniel chapter number 2, verse number 43. To mingle their seed with the seed of men. Watch what's going on. Ask God for wisdom. Ask Him for wisdom. Ask God to give you understanding. Because we're living in a time where Satan wants to do away with the human race. That's what transhumanism is all about. That's what all this junk that's coming is about. It's about destroying the image of God. And man is made in the image of God. And then after that, what do you have? The millennium? What's the millennium for? Think about this for a moment. Revelation 20, the Bible says that after a thousand years, Satan's locked up, bound, cast the bottomless pit. At the end of a thousand years, he's turned loose and Gog and Magog encompass the holy city. They come to Jerusalem where the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting and ruling and reigning. They come against them to overthrow the righteous reign of Christ on this earth. He's reigning then, folks. He's not reigning now, but when he comes, he will reign. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 11. And he will reign on the seat of David on this earth or in Israel. He's going to come and physically reign again. And he's coming after a thousand years has ended. Gog and Magog turned loose and they come against the holy city. So what God done, he's proved some things. He's proved it makes no difference how great your environment is. It doesn't make any difference how much light you've been given. It doesn't make any difference what kind of world that you are living in, your cosmos. It makes no difference. You as an individual make your own individual choices and you can choose you this day whom you will serve. And that is that image of God in you. Glory to God, you follow me. God's given you that, he's given you that ability to make a conscious choice. And if you, as Joshua said, choose life. If you choose the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you have chosen life. Amen, amen. It's that simple. It's like the dog and the man standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon's beautiful man standing there and taking in the glory of God. He's looking at that canyon and he's thinking, my goodness gracious. Somebody told me the other day, I forget who it was. They said, I've seen photographs of the Grand Canyon, videos of the Grand Canyon. He said, but I didn't know what I was looking at until I came to the Grand Canyon and stood on the edge of it and looked at that beautiful thing. 
So here stands the man looking at the Grand Canyon. His dog sitting next to me, next to him. Who's dog looking at? He's looking at the man. You understand? Why all the animal creation? All of them. All everything. Why do they get to a point of intelligence and they get no higher? Why is the man so much higher in intelligence than these lower creatures? You know why? Because you made the image of God, that's why. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Son of man that thou visiteth him. Made him a little lower than the angel for the suffering of death. But now we see Jesus. And then finally I'm going to close with this. And I think this is beautiful myself. You know in the Old Testament, how many ever heard of Joab? He, uh, he killed a man and he had blood on him. He had innocent blood on his hands. Finally, when it came down, he was gray-headed. He knew they were coming after him to take him and execute him. So he fled to the tabernacle. Joab did. He went inside and he took hold. He went to, inside the outer, outer gate and he took hold of the horns of the altar. Now, do you know what that represents? That represents a man that is coming and saying, God, I want your strength. I have no strength left. I'm coming to you for forgiveness. Have mercy on my soul. He took hold of the horns of the altar. You know what they did? They came and got him, drug him out of there, and they executed him. Something's missing there, isn't it? You can take hold of the horns of the altar this morning by faith, and no devil in hell can drag you away from that. That's your earnest right and privilege as a child of God. Luke chapter 4. This is the beginning of his ministry now. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. He came to Nazareth. That's where he grew up, folks. Where he'd been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Now watch this, to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister. In other words, there's nothing to be added to this. I'm the one that fulfills it. Notice that he said the poor. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come. He had known me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, here in this culture today, we immediately equate that with money. Never forget my grandfather and grandmother. I grew up with them. He was born in 1878, and they used to talk about the poorhouse. It equated to not having anything. This word means a little more than that. Listen carefully. To be thoroughly frightened, to cower down or hide oneself for fear. Hence, properly, one who slinks and couches often involving the idea of roving about in wretchedness at the end. In plain words, it is the spirit of the poor. Go to Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 3. Now look how the Lord in Matthew gives you a little more. Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor. What's it say? In spirit. See, it's not in, it has no issue with your bank account. There could be an issue where something may relate to that. So what does it mean? It means somebody who is literally beaten down by the culture where they live. All of this that you're reading here in Isaiah, they're all connected. Every one of these words are connected in the sense that you're beaten down. When you're down, they kick you. They take all of the opportunities away from you. You're born on the wrong side of the tracks. He said, I have come for you. I have come to preach to you. Now he does something over here in Matthew chapter 5. This word was a bad word this time 2,000 years ago. This Greek word, tokos, that was a bad word. It meant that this individual, you know, didn't, wasn't worthy, didn't fit. And so therefore to say somebody was tokos was to say, you're no good. You're where you belong. You're getting what you deserve. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I'm coming to preach to you. And the next thing he says is to preach the gospel. The priest hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Soon, tree ball. To tread down, to break down, to crush, to suffer extreme sorrow and be, as it were, crushed. Have you ever lost a loved one that just literally takes your desire to live away? You don't want to live another day. When you leave the graveyard, you say, I'm done. I have no desire to live. Remember a few years ago, in about 30 years, a man told the people his, his wife was sick. He said, when she dies, I'm gone. She died. He buried her. Next day, he took his life. He was not going to live in this world without her. He couldn't handle it. He was broken hearted. The Bible says of him when he comes, he will not bruised reed 
or the smoking flax. He didn't come to bruise it more. He didn't come to put it out. It doesn't make any difference how small inside your soul this morning. There's a little bit of light. Let me tell you what he'll do. He'll trim that candle and he'll give you more light. That's who you came to. He didn't come to the religious. He didn't come to the rich. He said he came for those people who need a savior. So what's that mean, preacher? It means that the preaching of the word of God, and just a little bit of it here, forces itself on nobody. He's saying that everybody in this world is going to fit one way or another in this. Because to live in this world is to live in what they called the veil of tears. Therefore, he said, I came to help you, preach to you, to give you the light. I'm going to close with this. God did not come, send his son 2,000 years ago to give you a list that will bring you close to God. Or a church that will fulfill all your needs. Or people that will fill up all the holes and emptiness of your life. He gave you a person. Now, once you accept that person, all these other things will be added to you. God knows what you need. He'll take care of that part. I encourage you this morning with everything that's in my soul. Do you want the light? Do you want the truth? You'll never find it outside of the light and the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want understanding? Do you want wisdom? Well, the Bible says Christ is the wisdom of God. All of the promises of the Old Testament are in a person now. So if you'd like to today and you've never tried it before in your life, just come and pray a simple prayer and say, Lord Jesus, that preacher said something, kind of got me thinking. Uh, if what he says is true, would you kind of help me out on this and, and, uh, and give me some understanding and wisdom and guidance in what he's saying? That's all you got to do. Well, you're supposed to get, no, you get saved. The saved part will come when the Holy Ghost gets done working on you and bringing you into conviction before God. Truth be matter, that when that time comes, nobody will have to lead you to the Lord. The Lord will lead you to the Lord. This is a start today. This is the beginning. Take that beginning. Would you do it? Be honest with yourself. You say, well, I'm not sure Christianity. Well, I don't care what you think. Try it. Put him to the test. Ask him to reveal himself to you. And ask him to show inside you what you really need. And don't leave it up to you to try to figure out your spiritual needs and condition. You can't do it. We need a person. Christ the Lord. Father, bless your word. I thank you for it. For all that heard it, bless them, help them. A lot of folks in here, Lord, that, that may have a desperate need. Who knows? I don't know. You don't tell me. I don't need to know. Maybe those watching right now, this thing streams out live. They know who they're talking to. They know who the Holy Ghost is talking to. They know I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. But they're hearing from somebody a whole lot higher than me. And I pray for them. I pray that you'd bless now. In Jesus' name, amen. Also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.